Welcome to Your Mac Life for Wednesday, October 1st, the first Wednesday of October year 2014. Show number 1027. I am your host, Sean King. Thank you guys very much for joining us, whether you're listening to the archive or listening in live. Thanks to all the folks in the IRC chat room. It's a small crowd tonight, but that's okay. If you want to join us in the IRC, as always, you can go to the website at yourmaclifeshow.com, and the IRC room is set up there already for you. Our good friend Monty has set that up. All you have to do is click in uh, below the video and you will see the field where you can just type in your IRC name and it drops you into IRC channel automatically. You don't have to know anything about IRC. You can join us in the IRC chat room at your leisure. Half the fun is there. Sly is here. Finally, Sly, is, I get worried when she doesn't show up on time. Hey, Sly. Sly has joined us. On tonight's show, we won't have our good friend Jim Dalmore from The Loop at loopinsight.com. Jim is flying back from London, England. He's probably flying Air Canada, which means he's going to be slow and have 17 stops along the way. He'll be stopping in Gander and Charlottetown and Toronto and all those places. So uh, Joe, uh, Jim won't be on tonight's show. Hopefully, we'll be able to do an Amplified tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So stay tuned for that, uh, for uh, details of what Jim has been doing in the UK the past week, along with uh, uh, participating, not participating, uh, going to the iTunes Festival in London uh, over the last few days. Amplified usually at 9 a.m. on 5x5.tv. So watch your Twitter stream for that or uh, go to 5x5.tv and check it out there. So on tonight's show, we're going to be talking about uh, my hands-on with the iPhone 6. I actually physically got to touch an iPhone 6 this past weekend. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the Apple Watch in Paris and the interesting situation that the Apple Watch was shown off in in Paris. And we'll also talk in our starting point photography segment about seeing the moment. And we'll talk about that later on in the show too. But first up, I want to say I got a, a, a couple of shout outs and thank yous. I forgot, I've forgotten in the past couple of weeks. First of all, the biggest shout out goes to, uh, to, to, to Leslie. Uh, my friend Leslie, business partner Leslie, uh, let me, I gotta get this up real, real quick. This is a nice, even if I do say so myself. Uh, where did it go? Where did it go? Here it is. Uh, Leslie, um, I was in a funk on the on the weekend, and so Leslie quite, quite kindly and generously um, tried to get me out of my funk, and it, it worked actually. Um, let me show you this picture of Leslie. Uh, this is uh, her and I down in Stanley Park. Uh, the view off to the distance there is the North Shore Mountains. That's where Sly, no, Sly doesn't live there. I'm sorry. It's not where Sly lives. Um, but that's the, the uh, uh, cruise ship, the uh, North Shore Mountains. That's Leslie in the, the foreground. She was uh, very kind and very sweet and rented me a motorcycle for the weekend. Went down to Cycle BC, cyclebc.ca, I believe is their URL. It's one of the few places literally in the world I've ever seen that rents the kind of motorcycle that I have owned, the Yamaha FJR Sport Touring Bike. Um, I love that bike. And so we, uh, we rented the bike on Saturday. Uh, I piddled around uh, Saturday and uh, then on Sunday, all day Sunday, rode the bike all over the place. I actually put Leslie on the back for a little while. She, she was scared but excited and, and had, had a lot of fun. Monday it rained and then because they screwed up, I got an extra day out of it. So Tuesday I, I ran around some more. So thanks to Leslie very, very much for that uh, mental health break. I really needed it this, uh, this past weekend. So, Leslie, thank you. Also, I forgot to mention, when I was in Prince George a few weeks ago, and uh, Vito Mori and I and his lovely wife, Becky, uh, Vito once again proves the old maxim that geeks get the cutest wives. Uh, Becky was, was sweet and wonderful. We had a lot of fun uh, sitting around at dinner. They had never had, or not never had, but I don't, uh, they weren't, uh, um, Whiskey connoisseurs. They didn't know much about whiskey. So, so we had some uh, Tullamore Dew, which is a nice, mild Irish whiskey, and some Bushmills 18-year-old Black Bush whiskey. So, uh, And they seemed to enjoy that. I got a message from Vito the next day saying, oh, my God, you have to give me a list of other whiskeys because Becky really enjoyed the whiskeys we, we had because she, she's not a beer drinker. She's not a wine drinker. Um, so she wanted to find out more about whiskey. And so I told, like I tell everybody, the Distiller app, uh, Distiller on the iTunes store, do a search for Distiller. The Distiller app is great for discovering new whiskeys, even if you're a, a, a connoisseur of whiskeys. But especially if, if you're a new whiskey drinker and not sure what to get and what to buy, uh, this, the Distiller app, which I brave about all the time on Twitter, is a great thing to check out. So again, thanks very much to um, Vito and Becky. 
this is going to be the last word that I have on Benghazi, on Bengate, on twisting and bending and breaking iPhones. It's mostly been a non-story. That's been, the fans of this have been flamed by the tech media and the mainstream media uh, because they're lazy, because they like conflict, and because, quite frankly, they know that stories of conflict, and in particular stories with the word Apple in them, get page views. We are in the age of click whore journalism. We are in the age of it doesn't matter what the truth is as long as your website, your URL gets hit thousands and thousands of times. Because the media knows if Apple is in the story, Apple fans will flock to the story to read it. Apple haters will flock to the story to read it. If the story is negative then the Apple fans will write comments, and the Apple haters will write comments back. Apple has said there's been only nine reported cases of people complaining directly to Apple about this bent phone issue. Out of the over 10 million they've sold, that's a non-story. But it's not a sexy story. There is no news outlet in the world who is going to interview someone who's going to hold up their iPhone 6 and go, this is the best phone I've ever had. It takes great pictures. I love it. I love the way it feels. This is a great phone. You're not going to see that story on your local news. It just doesn't happen. So unfortunately, we live in the area in the, in, in the era, era of this kind of sensationalism in our news reporting. And that's fine. You know, we know that. We're fans of your Mac life. We're fairly knowledgeable Mac users. We, we know that. The problem comes when people who aren't tuned into this kind of stuff start hearing these stories. Now, there's always going to be all different kinds of arguments whether this will or will not hurt Apple. It will hurt Apple simply by the fact that there is a certain percentage, and albeit probably a small percentage, of people who are sitting in front of their TV set And this story comes up on the news, and depending on how the news media reports it, usually badly, will say to themselves, hmm, I was thinking about buying one of those iPhone 6s, but if they break so easily, if they're so soft, I'm going to go buy a Samsung phone instead. Now, we're never going to know how many people that is, and it's going to be a small number of people, but it's still going to be a certain number of people due to the irresponsible reporting of the news media. It doesn't help when you have people who, first of all, we've all seen the story of the kids in the UK who've gone into the, who went into the Apple store and intentionally bent iPhones. That's a whole different thing there. That's, that's you guys being a-holes, but you're teenagers. I'm not cutting any slack, but you're teenagers. What's worse is stories like this. A Wall Street analyst walked into an AT&T store and tried bending the new iPhone. This guy is nominally a grown-up. This is a guy who's supposed to know better. Guy's name is Walter Peck, or Patch. I'm not sure how to say Walter's name. Just stopped in at an Apple, sorry, just stopped in at an AT&T, he tweeted this. Just stopped in an AT&T store and tried to bend a 6 Plus. You have to be kidding me. This is not bendable. It's embarrassing. I didn't check for myself earlier, but Bengate is ridiculous. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff about this stuff that's embarrassing you, a-hole. Not the least of which is you went into an AT&T store and tried to break something. You literally walked into the store... And picked up a phone and tried to bend it in half with your bare frickin' hands. Business Insider reports, we asked Peck if he'd asked permission from AT&T before trying to bend the phone. He says, no, I would have had to take a ticket to wait in line to ask for permission. 
you pompous a-hole. So not only are you so self-important that you can't be bothered to investigate this stuff ahead of time, not only are you such a jerk that you tried to bend one of these phones in half, but your justification for not asking permission was, oh, I'm too important to wait. I'm such a big man. I, I'm a Wall Street analyst. I don't need to wait for permission to bend things. As uh, Christine, uh, sorry, Christine, I've completely forgotten your name. Uh, Christine Warren, she's brain cramp there. Purposely bending an iPhone doesn't mean bend gate is real. It means you're an asshole. That's that's what it means. It means that that you do you go into a Ferrari dealership and and try to key the the the, the card, see if the, the the paint scratches. Do you go into a Sears store and plug in a Cuisinart blender and throw in rocks to see if the blades will stand up? No, you don't do those things. So why would you do it with, with the iPhone? Utterly idiotic. Utterly idiotic that people are acting this way. And again, in, in particular, people who should freaking know better. Apple came out late last week with a story I read about it on The Verge and saw, saw it in other places. Um, inside the building where Apple tortures the iPhone 6. The fun part about that story is that Sly and I had been in there many years ago at a, uh, a Macworld Expo. One of the guys who works at that lab, the torture test lab, invited Sly. I think Sly, correct me if I'm wrong, it was me, you, I think it was uh, uh, Steve Belnicki. We'd gone down Sly uh, often at the Macworld Expos in San Francisco would arrange these bus trips where we'd go down to Cupertino and go to the Apple store, the Apple employee store. And during one of these trips, um, our, fr- our friend who works, I don't know, if, yeah, we can say his name, Dave Martin. Dave Martin, who works at this lab, uh, invited us to come see the torture test lab. And it was really kind of cool. The kind of gear and the kind of things that they had there to, to shake apart MacBooks and mice and, and d- displays and everything it was really kind of cool. So it's kind of fun that uh, Sly, you and I were there 10 years before it was cool. <laughs> before all the other kids got to go. It was, it was, it was, it was a neat place. And, and uh, it, was, it was great to see behind the scenes of what Apple does and ask questions. And one of the questions I had was, you know, what happens if you guys find something that doesn't work properly? If, you know, if it doesn't fit the parameters of your bending and breaking and shaking and, and, and testing. They said, we have the power to say, no, you can't ship this thing, which is really interesting. Really interesting that those guys had that kind of juice that said, hey, if this thing doesn't pass these tests, you can't ship it. So it was, it was fun. It was, uh, I still remember going on, on that trip. We got to eat at the, uh, the, I think we, that time we got to eat at the cafe, um, the Mac cafe. But, I want to say thanks again to, to, to Dave Martin of, uh, of Apple for uh, allowing us to, to come down there and, and do that. It was a lot of fun. The other thing I did this past weekend, along with riding a motorcycle and, and enjoying it immensely, was going into the Apple store. Um, went in the Apple store with, with Leslie. And where were we? Metrotown? We were in Metro Town, the big mall here in uh, in Vancouver, and it was fun because she's not a Mac user; she's a PC user. She she has an iPhone, iPhone five S, I believe, um, and she's you know an average person with her knowledge of tech and everything else. Look at, uh, she's not a geek; she's not she's not a nerd. She's actually kind of a, a judge type thing in some sort of tribunals here in Vancouver. Um, so she ain't no dummy. So we walk in the Apple store, and the Apple store, it's, it's a Saturday afternoon. I'm oh, sorry, it's a Sunday afternoon. And we all know what an Apple store looks like every day of the week, particularly on weekends. And so I'm, I'm, we walked over to the iPhone 6s, and we picked them up. And, and we're, Now, the first thing I noticed with the iPhone 6, I, I grabbed my, my iPhone 5S. I did what everyone does, is you take your 4 or 5S, whatever it might be, and hold it up next to 
the six and the six plus. You want to see the size difference. And visually, it looks like the six plus is twice as big as your iPhone five. That's the first impression you get. But the second impression you get is that it doesn't seem, at least to me, as big as I expected it to be. I expected it to be like iPad mini sized, but it's not. It's still a good size. There's no doubt about it. It's still a good size. Now, for for reference sake, I can hide an iPhone 5 in my hand. Okay? My iPhone 5 is, is you know, being hidden by my hand. So that's how either small the iPhone 5 is or how big my hand is, depending on your, on your point of view. I could not do that with the iPhone 6 or 6 Plus. It was much bigger than my hand. But it wasn't uncomfortable in my hand. It's very light. It's very thin. It's surprisingly light and surprisingly thin. I don't know. I should have checked this beforehand. Someone maybe maybe you can check it for me. Uh, is it heavier or lighter than the iPhone 5, 5S, the iPhone 6 Plus? I think it's about the same weight. I know it's thinner. I don't know if it's heavier. It doesn't feel as heavy as the 5. You certainly are aware of the width. You will certainly be more careful of it, holding it in your hand. The biggest issue for me was the design of it. Now, because, and I remember, I like the original iPhone and iPhone 3G, the curviness of it. I like that very soft, organic feel to it. And the iPhone 5 doesn't have that. The iPhone 5 has relatively straight edges. And, but the iPhone 6 has gone back to that sort of soft curvy. But because of the soft curvy, and because I believe the finish of the aluminum case, it feels, and also because of the size and thinness, it feels significantly slipperier than any other iPhone I've ever had. It feels like it could fall into your hand easily, unless you're very, very careful. Now, I'm not one who regularly drops my iPhone. I have dropped it a couple times. Um, mostly probably trying to t- take it out of a pocket and it catching on my belt or my gut or whatever it might be and dropping it on the carpet. But my iPhone still, as I look at it now, there are no scratches in my iPhone. And I've never had a case on it for any length of time. I've used some test cases, but I've never had a case on it for any, any length of time. The iPhone 6 Plus is the first iPhone I would definitely want a case on it. And not a case to protect from drops, but a case to make it a little grippier. Make it feel a little firmer in my hand, a little safer in my hand. Oh, uh, backing up. ArcSign says, Sean, I wonder if the testing torture folks had any role in the switch from plastic to glass screens that Jobs made at the last minute. No. They didn't. Uh, that was a decision made by Jobs, who, who was convinced to do it by uh, someone else in the company. But it wasn't a torture test thing. Uh, Mosquito, I have a feeling that by the time I actually get my first iPhone, I'll be very disappointed at the lack of smaller size choices. Yeah, absolutely. Because unless Apple next year with the iPhone 7 either keeps the iPhone 5, which is unlikely, or designs the iPhone 6 or 7 to a smaller size, I think this is the way Apple's going to go. In a year's time, if they do what they've done in the past, they'll drop the 5. And you'll only have the choice of these larger iPhones. Which, for some people, is going to be bad. There's no doubt some people will not like the largeness of the iPhone 6. And will stick with their iPhone 5 for as long as they possibly can. Uh, Because it is big. I'm not saying it's not big. It is very, very big. But it's not as big as I had imagined it to be. You can definitely see yourself, for the most part, one-handed use. I tried the the, the, the reachability thing, which was kind of cool. But still, one-handed use is going to be difficult at times. It's definitely going to be a device. I can use my iPhone almost all the time. I can't remember ever holding my iPhone in one hand, my left hand, and using my right hand to tap on the screen. I can't remember ever doing that. Typing, I do it one-handed. If I'm text text messaging, I'm doing it one-handed. Scrolling, I'm doing it one-handed. Everything I do with with it is one-handed. 
But I can see, with the iPhone 6 Plus at least, having to do some things two-handed. Now, because of the larger screen, turning it sideways and typing on that larger keyboard, I could see myself becoming a two-thumb typer. That was very easy to do on the iPhone 6. I was surprised at how easily it was to do on the 6, especially with the predictive typing or predictive whatever the hell Apple's calling it. it makes it a lot faster than one-handed typing with the iPhone 5. You know, you turn it sideways, you've got a bigger screen, you've got a bigger keyboard, you have more space for the keys to sit, so therefore you're less likely to mishit them. It's a problem I have quite frequently when I, when I type on the iPhone 5, on the smaller screen, smaller um, keyboard. The other issue is the screen does look good. The screen looks surprisingly good. Surprisingly good compared to the side-by-side of the iPhone 5. I didn't, wouldn't have believed that Apple could make the screen look even better than it does now. Maybe if it was a bigger size, I don't know. But it does look really, really good. And the other thing is, and this is something both Leslie and I talked about, you know, we're getting older. I'm constantly, not constantly, but I often have to use um, just, you know, those reading glasses you buy at the drugstore, like the .25 reading glasses. You just got a pair around, you know, the five, ten dollar reading glasses. Because there are times when, perfect example, I got new business cards. There, thanks very much to to our good friend Mo for uh, Mosquito in the RC chat room for um, these these new business cards. Well, the text on these business cards that you, I'm showing you guys in the video, I can't read that. If I'm looking at that text, I literally I can. If I try real hard, paper sourced from sustainable forests, structure made from recycled pulp board. Moo is registered trademark. Thank you, legal folks. Okay, so I can do it if, if I work hard at it. But what I'll often do is just grab a pair of the, the reading glasses. By the way, Mo, Mo is the guy who designed my, my, my new business cards. Remember I had the smaller Moo cards? Well, these are full-size business cards that Moe's designed. And then on the back of them, I've got pictures that I've taken. So the various kinds of pictures I've taken over the years are on the back of these Moo cards. Really like this idea. There's a, the Orpheum chandelier. Uh, False Creek area of Vancouver. So I love, I love the idea of these cards, but I, but I wanted bigger ones, and, and, and Mo helped me design the bigger ones. So... The screen was really easy to read. Uh, it was, we saw a couple of emails on it. So it was really easy to read emails off of it without having to put on reading glasses, without having to have the screen uh, text enlarged. I checked, too, to make sure that it wasn't set to be bold text or larger text. It was set to the, at, at the default, and it was easy to read on the screen because, you know, the screen's bigger. You're going to get more text on the page. So that's, that's an interesting that, – that's, for me, is my biggest use case for my iPad is I'm often using it to read things on because my iPad's got a bigger screen. I read a lot. I read a lot on public transit. I read a lot when I'm sitting in a restaurant. Or I'm re- I read a lot when I'm just sitting in front of a TV watching a football game. I've got the iPad in front of me reading off the iPad. Maybe that'll change once I get the, iP- the, the iPhone 6 Plus. So it's going to be interesting to see if, if, it, if it will lessen my iPad use. Because right now, I use my iPad much more than I use my iPhone because my primary use for the, I, for the iOS device in general is reading and watching. Those are, in, in order, it would be reading, articles and books and that kind of stuff, watching TV shows and videos, and then playing the occasional game. And I wonder if the iPhone 6 Plus will change any of that, or at least change the percentage of time I'm, I'm doing that. Monty says, I'm not in love with the size. Mosquito, start with a full-size iPad to begin with. If you haven't got one already, then the change to much smaller will seem better. Um, if Apple makes future versions any larger, I may very well not upgrade to future iPhones, says Monty. It's just too big for my hands. Arc Sign says, I feel really cramped on the, on the 5C. 
I started with the iPad, and at first the iPhone just felt way too tiny. Uh, Mosquito loves his iPad Touch, and uh, he says, I never felt entirely comfortable doing more than a few quick things with apps like mail. I need a big screen to know where everything is. I don't do, I can't do a lot of mail on the iPhone because of that reason. The screen's too small. I'll, I've got a special email address just for the phone. My regular email, I, I get way too much of it to get it on the phone. I don't get any of my regular Sean at yourmaclifeshow.com emails on the phone because there's just too much of it. I get like a thousand pieces of email a day. And there's no way I could efficiently deal with that on the iPhone. So, that's not as much of an issue for me from that point of view. For me, it's like I said, it's reading. I read a lot. I read a lot of stuff, books and uh, books in the Kindle and Pocket is my, is my uh, read it later app. Um, Twitter, Safari, that kind of stuff. I read a lot. So I need a device that lets me on the go easily read a lot of stuff. Uh, as I said, email on air at yourmaclifeshow.com. I love getting emails from you guys. You can send me emails to sean at yourmaclifeshow.com, too, if you so choose. So, again, uh, I asked earlier during the pre-show uh, if you guys have gotten a 5. Sorry, if you guys have gotten an iPhone 6. I know Marcus down there in Brazil has gotten an iPhone 6. Uh, send me emails again, uh, yourmaclifeshow on air at yourmaclifeshow.com. Whether you're getting or going to get an iPhone 6 or a 6 Plus, if you already got one, what your impressions of it are. I'm looking forward to getting mine. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, getting one as soon as I can. The problem is availability. You know, we talked to the uh, the guy in the Apple Store in Metrotown. And, you know, he's an Apple employee. He's a good Apple employee. Ben. Hi, Ben. And he knows what to say and what not, not to say. So he wasn't going to give us any secrets. But, yeah, they get a shipment every morning. And there's a lineup outside the door before they open up of people who have pre-ordered their iPhone and they've got an email from Apple saying, come in and pick them up. There's very few available, sorry, none available for walk-ins. If you just walk into your local Apple store, it's highly unlikely that you'll get an iPhone 6 or 6 Plus. Um, now, I don't know if this is the same in the States, but here in Canada, you can reserve on the Apple website and then... Have, the, have it delivered, and then pick it up in the store and have it set up for your carrier right there in the store. So here in Canada, if you're Rogers or whoever else might have the iPhone. Or you can buy it directly from the Rogers website. Sorry, the Rogers. But like I said, the, the biggest thing for me is going to be the first thing I'm going to buy for the iPhone 6 is an Apple case because I think it really needs, this is the first iPhone I've ever said, where it needs, in my opinion, a case because of the slipperiness of the manufacture, of the aluminum, of the, the finish, of the thinness, of the size of it. So I'll definitely pick up an Apple case, but look, now I'm looking forward to seeing what the folks like at 12 Self come out with and, and those kinds of things. There was an interesting company called uh, LD West. We were talking about it uh, during the pre-show. Uh, ldwest.com, the Canadian company, uh, and they, they they saw me talking about the iPhone on Twitter, and so the PR person reached out and said, "Hey, you know, can we send you a, a, a review unit?" And I looked at this device and it looks. I can't tell if this is just cool and useful, or really too hipsterish for me. It's an iPhone and a wallet holster. Very much like, you know, like a cop would have his holster and a gun. Sorry, his gun and a holster. You know, kind of like under, under his armpit. It looks very gangsterish sometimes, or some of the pictures that look kind of gangsterish to, to me. Um, but on one side, you'll have your iPhone, and on the other side, you'll have your wallet. And I kind of like that idea. Made out of leather. I think it's actually made out of vegan leather, too, as a matter of fact. It's kind of an interesting idea. Now, I don't know if I'd wear it like these guys do, just with a T-shirt. I I'll definitely would wear it un underneath the jacket. But, uh, yeah, Mosquito says it's a half bandolier. And Nako wrote about something like this years ago, except with a full harness for multiple devices. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I'm, I, <laughs> I would not do a full harness for multiple devices. 
But something like this for for your iPhone in one side and your wallet in the other, I kind of like that idea. I've given up on the full-blown wallet cases. My apologies to the folks at Pad and Quill. My apologies to the folks at Disto Union. But I've lost two of the wallet cases. And through my own stupidity, it's got nothing to do with with their products. Their products are great. I like the Wally case. I like the Pad and Quill case. The problem is me being an idiot and losing and forgetting things and therefore not... The, the, the problem with these Wallet case things is when you lose one, you lose everything simultaneously. You don't just lose your iPhone. You lose your driver's license. You lose your credit card. You lose your money. You lose your your medical card here in Canada. You lose, you know, everything all at the same time. What a giant pain in the butt. And I had it happened to me twice. So I've given up on the on the combination wallet wallet cases and gone back to just right now my, my iPhone five doesn't have a wallet in it. Sorry, doesn't have a, a case on it at all. And I've got my usual little tiny wallet that's a that I have in my, my pocket. Hiker BC, isn't all leather vegan? <laughs> no, I think... Th- Wait a second. Okay, I, I see your point. And it brings up a question, what the hell is vegan leather? Leather made from carrots? <laughs> I think, hang on, hang on now. Let's just a second. First of all, let me check to make sure the... LD West case is in fact vegan, or whether I'm just talking about my butt, which is entirely possible. Sit it down, send it to create a stash function, create a holster, three pouch, cell phone sizes. No, they don't. So I, yeah, I may very well be making up the vegan leather thing, but that's a good question. What the hell is vegan leather? Hiker says, I get to see a cow eat a steak. Yeah? Fruit leather. Leather from cows that only eat soybean. Sounds like Mark and Dribble. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not Mark and Dribble. I, 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 yeah, because if nothing else, I don't care where my, le- where my leather comes from. As long as it doesn't come from human beings, I don't care. As long as it doesn't come from polar bears or pandas. If it's just cow leather or... I've got an antelope leather jacket. I'm okay with that. Kangaroo leather. Motorcyclists use kangaroo leather all the time. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I don't, I don't care where, where the leather, leather comes from, as long as it works the way it's supposed to. So they're going to send me out a reunion of the, uh, the LD West holster. I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to trying that out. Completely off topic, I posted this up in the loop and got some fun, fun uh, que- uh, comments from folks. The, the, the psychology behind Costco's free samples. And I didn't realize that this was a thing in other places. I always thought this sort of free sample thing was a North American thing. But it's not. Apparently, I've, I, folks from Italy and Brazil and the UK, have all, Japan, have all commented on this idea of, you know, you go to a store and there's either an open tray there with a toothpick and food that God knows how long it's been sitting there, or there's a person offering you free samples of cheese or meat or whatever it might be. I don't like that. I don't take that food. I know there's all kinds of folks who claim to, have, you know, they'll go to Costco for lunch and <laughs> they'll just eat samples, and that'll be their lunch. I I don't like that. Now the article associated with the story is kind of interesting because um, uh, behavioral economist, which sounds like a weird job. At Duke University says, if somebody does something for you, such as giving you a quarter of a ravioli and a piece of wax paper, you you really feel a rather surprisingly strong obligation to do something back for them. Do you believe that's true? Or am I a sociopath that doesn't believe that? (laughs) Granted, it may be true that I'm a sociopath, but I don't see it in that situation. 
uh, he says, if somebody does something for you, you really feel a rather surprisingly strong obligation to something back for them. Yes, if somebody does something for me that I ask them to do, or that's appreciated, but giving me free food in the supermarket doesn't engender that kind of obligation to me. You're employed by the store or employed by the food company to do this. You're not some little old grandmother sitting outside the liquor store offering me cookies. You know, a perfect example is uh, here in Canada and in most U- uh, United uh, Commonwealth countries, we have the tradition of the red poppy. In October and November, you'll see people in Canada and in the UK and probably Australia and other, other British Commonwealth countries wearing the, the, the red poppy. And those, at least here in Canada, are often sold, not sold, but often given out by veterans who will uh, sit outside uh, supermarkets and liquor stores and other high-traffic areas. Now, those folks I absolutely feel an obligation for. The poppies are given out by donation. You can just take one for free and walk away. But there's no way on God's green earth I would ever walk up to a, a poppy vendor, take a poppy, and then walk away. Now, they're getting at least five bucks out of me. That is an obligation that, that I feel and, and that I would sense. Not someone handing out free food samples in the supermarket. And I think this behavioral economist has got that wrong. Hiker BC says, I do like the Costco free samples. They have far better sanitary standards than the norm. Yeah, I, it's not a matter of sanitary standards for me. It's a matter of just, I, I just don't like it. And it's even if it's for stuff I'm going to buy. It's not just for stuff that I'm, I'm never going to buy, but I want a free sample of it. It's just, I, I just don't like it. Eric said, I like free ice cream samples. I love the Costco hot dog and drink for a buck fifty. Um, very good Polish sausage. Mosquito says, Trader Joe's does free samples every day. Every day, We have a cook station with little cups of stuff that changes every hour or tasting cups for coffee. I don't feel an obligation to them for that, but I do like their stuff and their prices are comparable to other supermarkets. I think part of it too is I'm also the, that's why I asked in the story, am I a strange or a weirdo for this? I also don't enter contests. Especially, you know, you go to a macro expo or a trade show and they say, hey, you know, enter a contest, win a free iPad. I, I, I don't do that. I've never done that. I've never filled those forms out. Not only because I know you're using that form for marketing, that you're going to sell that information to somebody. But in my mind, those kinds of things, I don't want to take that. I'm, I'm a member of the press. I can get almost anything that you're giving away as a prize from the company. So if I won it, it meant an average Joe couldn't win it. So that's why I don't ever enter those kind of contests. But even things like a contest at, at, the, uh, at, the, the, at the P&E. You know, fill this form in for a chance to win, but no, I don't do it. So I was just curious if, if anyone else. And the interesting thing that I thought was that this is not just a North American thing. This is fairly common in other places. Uh, someone wrote that in Japan they have very good uh, samples in some of the stores. It's not as common in the UK. It is fairly common in, in, in um, uh, other European countries. So it was kind of cool. You guys see the story of, um, let me pull this one up for you guys. Inside Apple's one day watch pop up during Paris Fashion Week over at Quartz. Uh, this was really interesting to me. Really, really interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, this is the, I think I think this is the first European viewing of the Apple Watch. Now, nobody could actually try it on. Nobody could actually touch the Apple Watch. This was not a press briefing. This was average folks in the streets of Paris could come into this particular store, and only one store. And not only was it the one store, it wasn't an Apple store. And that, to me, is really, really interesting. Apple did this at a store, I believe it's called Colette. Let me just check to make sure the name of it. Uh, yes, Colette. Uh, apparently, it's a cool, high-end concept, b- 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 high-end concept boutique during Fashion Week in Paris. So Apple could have done this in their own store. But 
they did it in a high-end fashion store, along with the likes of Anna Wintour, who is the editor-in-chief of Vogue magazine, and Chanel designer Carl Lagerfeld, who just creeps me out. Is it just me, or does ever, anyone else get creeped out by Carl Lagerfeld? I mean, this guy, I got a feeling this guy should have been dead like years ago. He's like a fashion skeleton. He's just kind of weird looking guy. <laughs> He's always kind of always kind of freak me out. Lagerfeld's a vampire. Yeah, says mosquito. Yeah, exactly. He's just a weird, weird looking guy. But Apple did this demo in a fashion store. Not in an Apple store. Does that mean that the Apple Watch will be sold in fashion stores? Yes. Absolutely. Does that mean the Apple Watch will be sold in high-end fashion stores? Absolutely. Guaranteed. Apple sending a signal that this is how they're going to sell the Apple Watch. This is the place where they're going to sell the Apple Watch. Now, you'll certainly be able to buy an Apple Watch in an Apple store. But Apple just told the world that we're going to be putting these in fashion stores, in watch stores in places where we normally don't sell Apple gear. And Apple's also telling you what they think the Apple watch is. That it's not just another technology device. They're telling you that, that Apple is saying this is a fashion device. This is fashionable. Now, the good and bad news of that is as and I'm not a fashionista or someone who follows fashion. Fashions go in and out of style. And there's a big danger for any company that chases fashion. That if you miss a trend, it can really hurt your company. Now, if you're like Apple and are a trend setter, then maybe you've got a leg up. But even if you set a trend that others don't follow... That hurts your company. So Apple is playing a very interesting game. They're going after a market in a very interesting kind of way to say, hey, this is the way we're going to sell these things. Still no information on pricing. Still no information on, on, on uh, availability other than next year and $349, $350. Um, Apple wouldn't a answer many, many questions of the, of the media to get more information. But this is the way Apple is going to sell these things. I think it's fascinating to me. Uh, the Colette store in, the, in this article says, uh, Colette sells an unlocked iPhone 6 for 1,500 pounds and a fancy jeweled iPhone 5S device. Five, oh, sorry, a fancy jeweled iPhone 5S for 3,100 pounds. This is not as the joke will go, your father's Apple store. The other interesting story I saw on this was f uh, the Apple Watch sneak peek by Patrick Crowley. And it's the exact same story. Okay, it's, a, it's, it's um, the same store, the same Colette store, the same uh, one-day pop-up of this. Except when you look at this one, Take a look at the pictures. He's done some really nice pictures of this stuff. And all his pictures were taken with his iPhone 6. These are really good pictures. I mean, these are, if you asked me, you'd say, oh no, these are a DSLR took these pictures. The pictures that he posted on his storehouse.com site are all from the iPhone 6. That's very impressive to me. It makes me want the iPhone 6 Plus even more, knowing that the pictures are this good at these sizes. These are, you know, full, I think they're, they're full resolution pictures. There's a lot of detail in these pictures. It looks really, really good. So keep this in mind when people start talking about 
the Apple Watch. The Apple Watch is not for techies. The Apple Watch, Apple saying the Apple Watch is not for geeks. The Apple Watch is not for nerds. The Apple Watch is going to be for people who are fashionable, who like fashion, who want fashionable things. That's who Apple's going to sell this to. Now, that's going to make the techs and techies and geeks and nerds lose their freaking minds. But Apple is telling you, this is where we're selling this thing. This is who we're targeting this at. You know, you techies and geeks, you want to buy it? Go ahead. Go nuts and buy it. Enjoy. Have fun. But you're not our target market for this. So don't expect this to do the same things that other smartwatches do. As others have pointed out, Apple's not even calling this a smartwatch. Apple doesn't refer to this as a smartwatch. They're separating themselves completely from that end of the market. If you want the Apple Watch to do the stuff that the Pebble Watch does, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but don't expect that kind of thing. This is a whole different beast. This is a whole different way of looking at these kinds of devices. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out next year in Apple's advertising and in how Apple is going to sell this to us. Because that's one of the things that we said off the, off the launch was, how are they going to do this in, in an Apple store? You know, at least with the products that are already in, in an Apple store, you've only got one or two choices. But the Apple Watch, I'm going to want to see, if I buy an Apple Watch, and I'm not going to, but if I buy an Apple Watch, I want to see different styles of bands on it, and how it looks on my wrist. And, you know, you take up a lot of time of an individual Apple Store employee. But if the watch is being sold in watch stores with staff who are already accustomed to doing these kind of things, with a setup that's already proven to work in selling watches, I think Apple will sell more Apple watches in non-Apple retail stores than they will in full-on retail stores. So it's going to be really interesting to see how, how this all plays out once Apple starts ramping up the marketing of this in the next few months. His shadow. Yeah, that will not stop the insane collective freak out that's coming in 2015. Mosquito. I'm not looking forward to years of nerd tech writers resenting the fact that the watch isn't for them. Monty. But, but, but I don't want to be fashionable. Well, then you don't have to buy a watch. Arc sign. Apple watch is for everyone that wants one, but it's clearly a a high society product line. Mosquito says, selling the watch in non-Apple stores presupposes heavy training for non-Apple people. Mosquito, one of the things that Apple does really, really well is train their staff. We all, we all know that. And this is one of those things I have to be careful how I say it. I've gone through Apple training in the past. And what Apple does is they've got a really good website secret website, password protected website that you go to and you read all this information about how Apple wants you to present things. And then you go through a test and it does a really good job of telling you what Apple wants you to talk to customers about and how they want you to talk to customers. So I can definitely see that Apple would in these non Apple stores offer the same kind of website, password protected website to either everyone in a particular store, say the Colette store in in Paris, or maybe the store would pick and choose, say, two employees who would be their Apple Watch salespeople. And those folks would take the test or those would 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 read the material. Um, I think that's the way Apple's going to be training the staff both in the Apple store and in non Apple stores. Mark Mac Mac Did Apple establish where they were going to sell the Apple Watches outside of the Apple Store? No, Mark, they have not said that. Apple's not said they're even going to sell it in the Apple Store. Apple's not said a word of where they're going to sell the Apple Watch. The assumption is, obviously, the Apple Store. That makes perfect sense. But, as I said, by showing it off in this Colette store, this high-end retail store in Paris, it's pretty obvious they're going to try to sell this in other high-end retail stores. Hiker BC, I look forward to buying an Apple Watch in Holt Renfrew or Nordstrom. Exactly. That's, I'm sure, where Apple can sell these things in. 
the higher end department stores, the higher end fashion stores, the higher end boutique stores. Because remember, that's Apple's target market anyway. I can't. Let's take a guess right now. Do you think Apple will sell the Apple Watch in Best Buy? Do you think the Apple Watch will ever be in sale on sale here in Canada, for example, at Future Shop? Radio Shack? Target? Walmart? I think the low-end version might be, the sport model. But I can't, there's no way the edition watch is going to be sold in any of those stores. In the Targets and the Walmarts and the Sears and the Best Buys and Future Shops. That's a $5,000 watch. Even the mid-range ones I can't see being sold in the Walmarts and Targets. I think that'll be reserved for the Holt Renfrews and the Nordstroms and the Colettes and the higher-end watch stores. Uh, Hiker BC says, uh, Mo, they already have watch company reps in stores like Nordstrom's and Neiman Marcus. So, yeah, they'll, they'll definitely be training those folks on how to sell the Apple Watch. Any comments on this? Whether you, are you are, are, are you going to get an Apple Watch when it becomes available? Well, let's assume that the price is three fifty for the basic sport model. Is that something that's attractive to you, or are you going to wait until you see what the other models are 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 on offer for? How much they're going to charge for them, or are you going to be like me and want to see it in person? Even in person, though, I don't think I'm I'm not I don't think I'm the target market for an Apple Watch. Certainly not, not the sport version. I don't move enough for the sport version. And as I've said many times in the show, I love my Tissot. I can't see replacing my Tissot with a watch that, for the most part, replicates my iPhone. So for me, no, I'm, I'm not going to get an Apple Watch. But are you? Email me to Sean at Your Mac Life Show or on air at yourmaclifeshow.com. Uh, Les Posen in Australia writes, uh, we are talking earlier, about the theory of social reciprocity. He says, yeah, it's a very true, often repeated finding. I don't, yeah, I, I, I'm not saying it's not true. I just don't understand how it could possibly work. I don't think, I know it works. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. In that situation of someone in a supermarket handing me a piece of pepperoni, and therefore, me feeling some, any kind of obligation to that person. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me in that situation. Overall, it does. Yeah, if someone does something nice for you, you feel some sort of obligation to fe- do something nice for them. I get that. But in this case, with the idea of someone handing me a piece of food, and therefore, oh, I have to go buy this pepperoni. I don't think that's going to work. Starting point photography segment. Um, as I said off the top of the show, thanks very much to to uh, the wonderful, kind, sweet, generous Leslie for renting me a motorcycle this past weekend so I could uh, get out of my funk and uh, have some fun riding. So Sunday, I get up and I want to ride places on the bike. So I live, for you folks who got g- Google Maps, I don't know, maybe you can do it. Hang on a second. Maps. So, there's this beautiful place in Vancouver called Stanley Park. It is uh, the, the, the typical urban um, urban uh, park that you'll find, you know, in any number of places. I don't know why that thing didn't come up. Come on. Give me directions. Directions. Stanley Park. Stanley Park. What's happening? You know, it's it's the typical um, uh, urban urban oasis that you'll find in, in any number of cities. Central Park. Um, those kinds of places. I'm just trying to pull this up. Pull this up on the map so you, so you, all, you can all get a sort of an idea of what I'm talking about. So what I do is I live way the hell out here in Surrey, British Columbia. Middle of nowhere. And to get to Sydney Park, you got to drive on the Trans-Canada Highway 
all the way in to downtown. And if traffic is good, that's a 36 kilometer trip at 44 minutes. But that, I'm not doing that. I'm on a motorcycle. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't doing that route. So what I did actually was did the other route, which is off the Trans-Canada Highway, because, you know, you don't want to drive the train. You, you, when you're on a motorcycle, you don't want to drive on the interstates. It's just boring. So by not going on the interstates, it becomes a hour and 16-minute trip, which is great. The longer, the better. So I get down to Stanley Park, and there's this wonderful road, one-way road around Stanley Park, 30 kilometers an hour around Stanley Park. And so I'm piddling around on, on the motorcycle. And there's a spot in Stanley Park, which I've been through Stanley Park a hundred times, but I don't remember ever seeing this one thing. And it's the Empress of Japan uh, figurehead. And I had it here somewhere. Hang on a second. I had it here in the... There we go. So it's this replica of a ship's uh, figurehead that the uh, Vancouver Province newspaper uh, re redid in the in the sixties. And so I saw that, and then off in the distance, you can see the Lionsgate Bridge, a very famous bridge here in Vancouver. And as I drove by this, I thought, oh, man, I'll bet that's going to make a this – was, this was like 11, 11 o'clock in the morning. I drove by and thought, oh, this, this could make a really nice picture around sunset. So drove around, drove around, drove, drove around. Came back into town, picked up Leslie, and put her on the back of the motorcycle. She was terrified. She, she, she used to ride a scooter, so she's not unfamiliar with two-wheeled vehicles. But the Yamaha FJR is not a scooter. <laughs> so she got in the back and, and I'm not that guy who's going to scare her or do something stupid to, to frighten her or anything else like that. I'm going to be a very calm very cautious rider but riding a motorcycle is always going to be dangerous there's no way around it so we you know take our time wandering around the city we went, went to Metro Town to see the Apple store and, and, and drove around had lunch and that kind of stuff so it comes up on I'm getting towards sunset I said let's go down to Stanley Park and so we do, and we come around this scene. And as we were coming through downtown, I noticed there's a place here called uh, uh, Pacific Center. Not Pacific Center. Um, what's the place for the cruise ships dock? Hiker? Sly? Pan Pacific? Yeah, Pan Pacific. So I saw cruise ships there. And I know that cruise ships, at least here in Vancouver, generally arrive in the early morning and leave in the evening. I thought, I wonder if the cruise ship is going to be leaving the, the dock at sunset. So I, we're driving through, driving through, and I hear, we stop off at Sandy Park, and, and, and I, I see um, this shot. And I hear the cruise ship horn, the long, you know, long blast on their, on their horn, which means the cruise ship is you know, leaving the dock. I thought, oh, my God. What is the picture going to be like standing here at this spot with a cruise ship going underneath the Lionsgate Bridge off there in the distance? And this is something I talk about in the class that I teach all the time is seeing the moment. Canada Place. Thank you, Sly. Can Canada Place. Um, it's called seeing the moment. Seeing the image that you're going to shoot before you even take the picture. Imagining it in your mind's eye. As opposed to just taking a snapshot real quick, whipping your phone up and taking a picture, composing the picture, thinking about the picture firsthand, standing in the right spot, moving around to see what the best angle is, trying to figure out, oh, if I stand over here, will it make a difference to the shot? If I move this way, will it make a difference to the shot? If I lean down, if I stand up, if I, if I, if I. So that's what I did was we, we stood around probably for 10, 15 minutes waiting for the cruise ship to 
come underneath or come towards the, the Lionsgate Bridge. I took a couple test shots to make sure that it was going to come out the way I had imagined it was going to come out, and then waited for the cruise ship to come by the space. So here's the first picture. So this is the picture of, of me just standing at the Empress of Japan figurehead and waiting for the cruise ship. The cruise ship is going to be coming from the right-hand side of, of the image. And here's the image as, as the cruise ship comes through. So this is the image that I pictured before it was ever even happening. This was the image that I imagined in my mind's eye. This was the image that I saw in my mind's eye before the cruise ship even left the dock. It's, as I said in the class, the difference between taking a snapshot and creating an image. Taking a picture and making a picture. I didn't just take this picture. I made this picture, if you understand the difference. It makes a huge difference if you to your photography. If you're able to think about the shot ahead of time, picture it ahead of time, and create it in your mind's eye ahead of time. So I knew how to set my camera up. I knew the kind of shot I wanted with the focus. I knew I wanted the focus on, I actually took several shots, one with the focus on the figurehead, one with the focus on the cruise ship, one with the focus on the Lionsgate Bridge off in the distance. So standing there and thinking about this image beforehand allowed me to create the image I wanted to. And then... Luckily for me, another image popped up. I'll show you guys this one. I don't know if this one's going to come out as well. All these are, are going to get posted on the, on the Starting Point Photography website, by the way. This couple sat down on the bench underneath the or near the figurehead. And just by moving myself a little bit to the right, I was able to capture the Lionsgate Bridge the figurehead, the couple embracing on the bench, and the cruise ship off in the distance. By being patient and waiting. I could have just taken that one shot and then walked away. But if you have the time to think about your shots and create your shots and, and imagine your shots, you have the patience to stand around and wait for other shots that come up in the same situation. So this is going to be the first uh, mosquito says, I really have the foresight or patience to plan stuff out like this. It's good to keep in mind. Thanks for saying that, mosquito, because that is definitely one of the ways, one of the things I teach the classes that I teach is you have to have patience. You know, you can't just, it's very rare that you get that lucky that you just, in that instant, see the shot, take the shot, get the shot. Most of the time, you're taking dozens of shots. You're manipulating yourself, the camera, the, the lights, whatever it is, to create that wonderful image that, that you see in your head. Very, very rarely will you ever get that, bam, one shot done kind of thing. So, so you, have, you have to be patient. To get good shots, you have to be patient. Monty says, photography definitely teaches me patience. Um, yeah, the steam clock, Monty, we're, we're, we're going to get pictures of, of that uh, uh, later on. So this is a way of me telling you guys, um, this is going to be the first example in the new Starting Point Photography newsletter. And you are all invited to subscribe to the, to, to the newsletter. I'm going to get the uh, URL for it up here in just a second as soon as I find it. What the hell did I done with it? Is it here? Yes, here it is. Um, yml.me forward slash SPP newsletter. Sure, this works for you guys. So, so HTTP and you know, all the usual, all the usual stuff. YML.me forward slash SPP newsletter dot com. So, the newsletter is going to come out once every probably three weeks, and it's going to have you know a tip in it. It's going to have a picture in it, a little explanation of the picture. It's going to have reviews of software, either my own or others. Uh, hopefully, if the newsletter gets popular, we'll be able to give away prizes. Uh, but it's basically going to be a newsletter that goes along with, with the classes. So if you're at all interested 
in photography in general, in starting point photography in particular, um, please sign up for the, sign up for the newsletter, uh, yml.me forward slash SPP newsletter will get you the subscription form. And as always, you know, the, the, your email address will never be used to spam you or be sold or any of that kind of crap. You guys know me, should know me well enough by now to know that I would never, ever do anything like that. So you don't have to worry about me, uh, doing something stupid with your, with your information. So that's the, that's the, 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 the thing to think about the next time you start taking photos is to create an image takes time and patience, a little bit of luck. There's no doubt about the luck part of it. It takes a bit of paying attention to your surroundings. You know, if I hadn't been listening for the sound of the cruise ship's foghorn or the cruise ship's horn, Maybe I wouldn't, wouldn't have gotten that shot because I asked Leslie and she didn't hear it. She was standing right there with me and she didn't hear the, the cruise ship horn. I heard it, knew what it meant, and then visualized what was going to happen in the scene in front of me. So try that next time you're, you are out shooting. <laughs> Sly says, Nashville starts in 25 minutes, so need to wrap needs to wrap up by then. Otherwise, I'll be zoned out. Don't worry, Sly. I'll wrap up. Time for you to get to Nashville. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, oh, by the way, Monty was talking about the, um, the steam clock. One of the reasons why we used to have the show broken up in 15-minute segments was uh, Sly and I used to do the show down in Gastown in a office building right next to the steam clock. Like, literally, it was the next building over. And the steam clock goes off every 15 minutes. And you could hear it from the office. You could hear it over our microphones. So we had to be in commercial break every 15 minutes so, so, so we could miss the sound of the, of, of the steam clock. It was actually kind of funny that we had to uh, uh, try to work around the sound of that, uh, that, that steam clock downtown. Simon Holden, he says, uh, after you're reminiscing over your first iPod last week, you made me dig out all the iPads we have in the house that I could find. Well, when he says all the iPads we have in the house, that was kind of surprising. He has an iPod with scroll wheel, 5G, the original 2001, the iPad, iPod Photo, 60 gig, the iPod Video, 60 gig, the iPod Mini, 4 gig, iPod Nano, 4 gig, silver, iPod Nano, 8 gig, red, iPod Nano, 8 gig, 6th generation, iPod Touch, 1st gen, iPod Touch, 3rd gen, missing from the photo, Simon says, is the iPod Shuffle, the iPod Click Wheel, the iPod Nano, 4 gig, blue, the iPod Nano, 4th generation, the iPod Nano, 8th, Sixth generation, the iPod Touch, 32 gig, third generation. <laughs> he says, um, the iPod Shuffle, he's not seen that for ages. The iPod Click Wheel, lost it on a train. iPod Nano, lent it to a sister-in-law. iPod, other iPod Nano, lo- buried in a drawer somewhere. iPod Nano, six gig, second of two. iPod Touch, second of two. That makes 14 iPods in our house, plus one that I lost. They all still work with the exception of the fourth gen nano. Only six iPhones so far. That's from Simon. Thanks very much for that picture, Simon. That is hilarious. You guys have that many iPhones still around in your home. Scott Randall from the Long Island Macintosh user group says, uh, thanks for reading my comments a couple weeks ago. I realize what you're saying, but I would like to see what the rest of your listeners think. Oh, by the way, have you seen that Macworld is still offering subscriptions to the print magazine on their website? I actually had to go and check, Scott, because I couldn't believe that I did you be so freaking stupid as to still have on their website the iPod, sorry, Macworld Magazine subscriptions. So sure enough, I go to Macworld.com, and you folks can do this along with me, Macworld.com. I guess spell it right. Macworld. Mac. How do you spell Macworld? Here we go. Macworld. And there at the top, it says subscribe. And I thought, okay, well, you know, you can subscribe to their digital edition of the, the, of the magazine. That's fine. It's no problem. But you read down here, it says print annual subscription $21.97. They're still selling print editions of the frickin' magazine. Didn't you guys get the memo? Stupid, stupid people. Come on. 
Scott says, uh, you were actually the second person that week to tell me I'm not the typical user. I would, however, venture a guess that there are many, many non-typical users out there. Yes, you are, you are correct, Scott, there are. I'm a physics teacher and a musician, so my needs are varied and not typical. But I am sure there are plenty of other people like me, maybe minority, but still large enough to be significant. That's the problem, Scott. No, it's not large enough to be significant. To Apple. Remember, Apple's amount of significant has changed over the years. When Apple was selling 100,000 Macs in a quarter, they wouldn't turn around 20,000, sorry, they wouldn't turn away 20,000 people who were, who were willing to buy a specific kind of Macintosh. But now they're selling 4 million Macintoshes in a quarter. They're not going to, they're going to turn around. 20,000 people is nothing to them. Nothing anymore. So even though your kind of user wanting a particular kind of Macintosh may be not zero, and it's not, it's still not a large enough number for Apple to develop, to test, to sell, to stock, to support any kind of specific kind of Macintosh. They're a general computing company nowadays. Like I said, I'm pretty sure I said in last week's show, the good old days of Apple making 15 different versions of a Performa are long gone, and for a lot of us, happily so. But if you need a specific configuration with a specific use case, Apple's not making those anymore, and they're just, they're just not going to. He's one more. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my goodness. Hang on. And one more thing. Are you testing out Yosemite? No. No. Not a chance. I'm not a beta tester for Apple. I'm just, <laughs> Apple's not paying me to test out their software, so I'm not testing it out. I have better things to do than muck around with beta software in general. Apple's release software is bad enough. The stuff they put out to the public is bad enough that I've got to worry about how it's going to react. I mean, the, the iOS 8 and iOS 8.1 updates just this past week, though that wasn't beta. Sure as hell felt like beta. So, yeah, there's no chance I'm beta testing Yosemite for Apple. No chance. Uh, Don Beck in Martha's Vineyard, USA. Just a few thoughts on the iPhone 6 Plus bending. Many, many years ago, I bought a really cool, at the time, credit card size scientific calculator. It fit very nicely into my back pocket. A few days later, I broke it by sitting on it. The LCD display broke and the calculator was useless. I've never carried anything like that in my back pocket ever again. Lesson learned. I carry my iPhone in a horizontal holster on my belt. Now, the real point. After watching a YouTube video showing a guy bending his iPhone 6 Plus to show that it can be done, instead of being horrified that it was bendable, I was impressed that it still worked. <laughs> Way to go, Apple. Just my two cents from Don Beck in Martha's Vineyard. That's something else, too. Have you, have you noticed that? That, that? The screen on these things usually stays intact. Even when, the, when it separates, the phone sometimes keeps working. That's pretty damn impressive, too, Apple. Good for you guys. Lauren Finkelstein about the Chinese mafia. Sean, as someone who has experienced this firsthand, I'd like to offer a complaint that isn't racist in nature. Apple only allows people to buy two phones. Why do they do this? Where is the capitalism in such a decision? Wouldn't it be just the same for them to sell 100 phones, the first person in line, or 1,000? Presumably, they do this to stop someone from bulk buying all their stock and then reselling it. Why would they care? Except for the disappointment of all the other people in line. Fair point, Lauren. Well, someone has found a way around this. They are hiring hundreds of people to get in line, buy their two allowed phones, hand them off to someone, and then get back in line. I witnessed this myself last year with the iPhone 5S release, and again this year for the iPhone 6. It's no different than if Best Buy had hundreds of their employees go to the Apple store, get in line, buy the phones, and bring them all over to Best Buy to sell it some huge markup. Yes, it's just capitalism, and no, I don't expect Apple to do anything about it. But it is disappointing. And I don't believe that my feelings are racist in nature. No, Lauren, I don't think they are. I don't care what race these people are. I, don't, I just don't like that they are skirting the two phones per person rule, making it harder for the general public to get a phone. I don't even think this affects me because I'm looking to get an AT&T phone and I expect they're all getting unlocked phones only. Anyway, I just wanted to give you my perspective on the issue of Lauren Finkelstein. 
Not a problem, Lauren. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yoram Sneer, or Snur. My apologies, Yoram, if I'm saying your name incorrectly. In episode 1026, you talk about iPhone in a car crash. Will it survive or not? Well, I had a severe car crash in 2004. My Nokia phone and Apple Titanium G4 laptop both survived while I was rushed to the ER for surgery. The laptop, made of titanium, had a broken frame, but somehow it was working fine for another three years. The phone did not show any scratches, although I was found on the back seat and not in the front. The car engine was squished into the dashboard, the roof collapsed, and it was towed directly to a junkyard. To summarize this, I would recommend to spend a couple of minutes and set the emergency medical ID just in case. Thanks, Jorm. Jorm, I hope you're okay from that sounds like a horrific accident. And yeah, there's no doubt that you should set up a medical ID. I have no problem with doing that. Don't, don't not set up a medical ID. Just in the off chance that maybe, God forbid, something happens and the EMT knows enough to check your phone. But don't rely on it, is what I'm saying. Um, and finally, uh, from Robert Scott, I thought it was a blessing that your order for the iPhone 6 Plus failed because they appear to bend easily. No, they don't bend easily. But it sounds like you are aware that some users have bent their iPhone 6 Plus and you still feel comfortable getting the 6 Plus. Yeah, I feel completely comfortable getting the 6 Plus because I'm not an idiot. All right? I'm not going to bend the phone on purpose. I'm not going to take the phone to the box and then just twist the thing so much that it bends and breaks. I'm not a freaking moron. Now, if I put it in my back pocket and sit on it, that's my fault, not Apple's. If I put it in my front pocket and sit on it, that's my fault, not Apple's. If I don't take care of my electronics and they break, that's my fault, not Apple's. If I drop my Nikon D600, I don't expect Nikon to replace it. I did it. I broke it. I'm responsible for it. So I pay for it. Rob, this is Rob Scott's in Independence, Kentucky. He says, as of Tuesday, my wife and I are happy with her first new activated iPhone, the iPhone 4S running iOS 7. So far, it's the only iPhone we've ever experienced, so we're easy to please. All right, good, good for you, Robert. Congratulations. Good to hear. Uh, folks, that's it for tonight's show. I want to say thanks very much to uh, you guys for being tuned in. Again, whether you're tuned into the show via via the archive or whether you're tuned in via the live show. And I want to thanks, th say thanks to all the folks in the IRC chat room for joining me here this Wednesday evening, the first Wednesday in October. And uh, hopefully next week we will have our good friend Jim Downport from The Loop at Loop Insight back on the show. If you are interested, I'm pretty sure we're doing an Amplified tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So check it out at 5x5.tv for more details or follow Jim and or me on Twitter and you'll be able to find out exactly when we're going to be doing an Amplified. So until next week, as always, folks, I've been Sean King and you've been tuned into your Mac life. See ya!